Hello fun people, I'm Isaac Carlson, and today we're going to be exploring the full stories of all of the unique, complex, and tragic villains from across the original Kung Fu Panda trilogy. Each of the Dragon Warriors' foes will be broken down as we dive into their backstories, their falls from grace, and their inevitable defeats. I'm very pleased to bring you this collection of videos I've created from throughout the past few years, all dedicated to this legendary saga. And of course, there's no better place to begin than with Tai Lung, the son of Shifu who longed to be be the Dragon Warrior. Long ago, Tai Lung was born to a family of snow leopards likely outside of the Valley of Peace. Beyond his mother and father, years later, a sibling of Tai Lung had a son named Peng, who would go in search of his uncle, revealing Tai Lung's family was connected, was aware of his existence, and did have some kind of desire to find him. Peng grew up in a nearby land to the Valley of Peace, so it's possible Tai Lung originated from that same place, but it's really unknown where he was born, who his family was or what happened to them because Tai Lung never knew any of them. Somehow, Tai Lung was left wrapped in cloth outside of the Jade Palace, the home of Master Ugwe and Kung Fu, without any of his family nearby and was discovered by Shifu. In response to finding the child, Shifu embraced him as his own, likely because Shifu understood the hardships that came from being alone in the world. You see, many years before the discovery of this baby snow leopard, Shifu had been abandoned by his father at this same place. He knew what it felt like to be without any guidance, so he decided to be the guardian of Tai Lung similarly to what Ugwe had done for him. Shifu just wanted to do what was right by the boy by believing in him, which is why he gave him a name meaning Great Dragon. Regardless of who created Tai Lung or where he came from, he was raised, watched over, and loved by Shifu. Master Shifu became Tai Lung's father, and later on, his master. After showing promise in the art of Kung Fu and discovering he was a true prodigy, Shifu decided to train Tai Lung, believing he had the potential to become one of the most capable warriors that the world had ever known. Over time, Shifu even became convinced that Tai Lung would one day be chosen as the Dragon Warrior, the legendary individual for told by Master Ugwe, who would rise to the highest levels of Kung Fu and obtain limitless power through the knowledge within the Dragon Scroll. Through every lesson, Shifu slowly molded Tai Lung into someone who craved excellence, knowledge, and power in hopes of motivating him to seize a destiny he would be unable to reach. To unlock all of his potential, Shifu gave him unrelenting love and praise, which kept Tai Lung hoping to continue to push through all of his breaking points to please Shifu. The interesting truth that lives in Tai Lung's story is that he didn't want riches or to take over China or to dethrone Uwe. Tai Lung was constantly fighting to make his father proud. Of course, Shifu was proud of Tai Lung though, but that didn't stop the boy from literally pushing his bones to break in the pursuit of perfecting the art form he was studying. The intensity of the training didn't burn Tai Lung out, but really only led him to strive to accomplish more. To be the strongest, fastest, and most furious fighter that Tai Lung could become, he leveraged all of the master's knowledge and training resources he could, inevitably bringing him to be the first person to master all 1,000 scrolls of Kung Fu. Tai Lung became committed to becoming the greatest warrior in the world, and for the most part, he accomplished that. He unlocked all of the martial and spiritual secrets understood by Master Uwe, all of the wisdom of generations of martial artists, including unique styles, weapons, techniques, and tactics, had been mastered by Tai Lung. With Shifu's guidance, Tai Lung had truly risen to a place in Kung Fu that put him above his father and only below the creator of Kung Fu himself. Other than Master Ugwe, there was no mortal who would be able to defeat him. Of course, Kai would be able to defeat this master in the spirit realm, but that wouldn't happen until Tai Lung was sent there by the true dragon warrior. And this is an idea that I've discussed in the past. The reality that Tai Lung's chi was eventually stolen by Kai is an episode I'll leave linked down below. We know a little bit about Tai Lung's fate as a spirit warrior, but until he got to that point, he spent his life in the mortal world constantly training. Tai Lung was drilled his entire life by Shifu that he was going to rise to be some something beyond himself. So he had those expectations placed upon him. What Shifu failed to see was that by pushing Tai Lung to become completely invested in the pursuit of rising to be the Dragon Warrior, Tai Lung failed to create self-worth and an identity for himself beyond that. Tai Lung was consumed by pride. 
That's why even after going through all of that intense, rigorous, and brutal training and rising to new heights in the kung fu world, nothing was enough for him. Unfortunately, this longing for more knowledge and the ability to set free all of his potential would become his dark obsession, and Shifu loved his son too much to see that rising. Master Ugwe, on the other hand, saw that corrupted heart within Tai Lung. So when Shifu presented his child to Ugwe, he rejected Tai Lung's inquiry of becoming the dragon warrior, much to the master and student's dismay. For Tai Lung's entire life, he had been told he was destined to be the dragon warrior, but when his opportunity to be chosen finally came, his master rejected him, and his father did nothing to stop it, leading him to feel truly betrayed. With a deep sense of failure, confusion, and anger, along with entitlement, arrogance, and pride, and the belief that he was deserving to be the dragon warrior, Tai Lung channeled his rage into laying waste to the Valley of Peace. His fragile sense of stability and peace were shattered, and he was willing to destroy the home that had welcomed him and raised him to prove that no one could stop him. Tai Lung allowed himself to be consumed by his own ambition, which of course also led him to return to the Jade Palace in hopes of taking the Dragon Scroll by force. Shifu, feeling responsible for creating Tai Lung, tried to destroy what he had created, but was unable to face the son he loved. Only through Uwe using a nerve attack to block Tai Lung's chi was the Snow Leopard stopped. What I find so interesting about Tai Lung as a villain was that he was so knowledgeable on the art of Kung Fu, while at the same time, he remained an extremely ruthless person. He was able to show that he was destructive and intelligent, and had a lot of humanity below the surface. While in Kung Fu Panda 2, we got a deep dive into Shen's psychology, we got to see many glimpses of Tai Lung's tortured soul throughout the original Kung Fu Panda. I think that's something that the first two Kung Fu Panda villains do extremely well. We are able to empathize with these deranged figures. Tai Lung isn't just a wild, loose cannon, he's also a tortured son, and we are able to see all of that come through. Under Ugwe's instruction, Shifu ordered the construction of Chor Gam Prison to house Tai Lung. And as a true testament to how powerful Tai Lung had become, Ugwe was also forced to design an acupressure restraint system made out of a tortoise's shell that was able to consistently disrupt Tai Lung's chi, and would only further tighten as as he moved. After Chorgon Prison was finished being built into a mountainside, complete with 1,000 rhino guards known as the Anvil of Heaven, massive crossbows, armed explosives, the acupuncture, chi disrupting restraints, and chains attaching boulders to his arms, Tai Lung was trapped, and the world believed that one of the most formidable kung fu masters would be locked away forever. Twenty years later, though, he would return after Ugwe foretold that Tai Lung would venture back to the Valley of Peace. Fearing Tai Lung's return, Shifu ordered a messenger goose to double the guards and tighten security within the prison because of Ugwe's vision. But by sending that goose, Tai Lung's escape became possible. With a single feather falling to Tai Lung, he used that to release himself from his restraints on his back and used the weapons that were meant to put him down to break his chains. While he had been banished for decades, his ferocity, strength, focus, and speed had not been significantly weakened. He was still a practically unstoppable warrior who was able to maneuver out of the pit he had been placed within, avoid the weapons that were used against him, take down the guards who confronted him, and inevitably was able to finally break free of his prison. The next generation of Kung Fu warriors had formed the Furious Five again, and did attempt to work together to end Tai Lung's journey at the rope bridge that led to the Valley of Peace known as the Thread of Hope. But while they fought valiantly, Tai Lung was able to overwhelm them and use his advanced techniques to take them down. His desire for the Dragon Scroll had not been stopped, especially when he was aware that Uwe had finally chosen the Dragon Warrior. Tai Lung was ready to prove himself to the world and his father, and was excited to finally have a worthy adversary. When Tai Lung arrived in the Valley of Peace, though, the village had been abandoned by the citizens with only Master Shifu remaining. While he had been excited to meet Po, he was ready to face his former master, who he believed had wronged him all of those years ago when he did not stand up to Uwe. Channeling all of his rage and resentment, he beat down the man who had raised him, and only wavered for a moment when 
when Shifu apologized to him, but his heart had hardened too much for him to give up on his mission. This to me is the big fight for Tai Lung. He gets to take on Shifu, dominate in a duel within the Valley of Peace in a spectacular way and shows off how formidable he had become. It's much more of the serious climactic fight which I love to watch, but it isn't the one that Tai Lung himself longed for. That's why when the Dragon Warrior arrived, Tai Lung tossed Shifu away in hopes of securing his destiny by defeating that Chosen One. But of course, it wouldn't be that easy for him to glimpse upon the legendary scroll. At every turn, Po was able to outsmart, outmaneuver, and outfight the ambitious and prideful Tai Lung, driving him mad as the panda effectively countered his attacks and sat on his face. And even after learning that there was no secret that would allow him to unlock a new power within himself, Tai Lung was unwilling to stop the battle as he just continued to underestimate Po and live in denial of the truth. Tai Lung was unwilling to accept that his true power came from within because that would mean that he would have to embrace the idea that his violence, anger, and descent into darkness was pointless. And this forced Po to stop the committed, knowledge-seeking, and self-tortured master. After a draining fight where Tai Lung had used all of his brutal, cunning, and relentless attacks against Po, the Dragon Warrior banished Tai Lung to the spirit realm using the the Wuxi finger hold. The Valley of Peace was safe once more. Shifu was able to see he had undone his mistakes by training Po, and Tai Lung was forced to face the truth that he was never going to be the Dragon Warrior. While there were some tales that suggested Tai Lung survived the Wuxi finger hold and went on to establish a criminal empire, the truth was Tai Lung's reign as a mortal warrior had concluded. But even though Tai Lung was torn from the mortal world, his time as a spirit warrior has only just begun. We'll discuss what happened to him after he was skadooshed later, but for now we're going to focus on the story of Shen, the peacock who could not escape his destiny of being defeated by a panda. Lord Shen was born to the rulers of Gangmen City, a place of joy and prosperity as well as the home of beautiful fireworks. When Shen was older, he would reminisce about playing by his father's throne when he was growing up, and that he was always told that one day he would inherit the responsibility of sitting upon it, though that day would never come for Shen would follow another path. Until his crossroads would come though, Shen lived as a noble prince who was draped in silks, was likely highly educated, and was instructed to become a capable warrior who was watched over by his nanny, who would later just be known as the Soothsayer. That's one of those facts that I found on this old DreamWorks website, so it's not one of those things that I really was aware of until I started looking into Shen's story. While his parents and the citizens of Gongmen City adored their fireworks, when Shen was growing up, he studied them and eventually learned to unlock the destructive power that existed within them. Concerned for their son's growing darkness within his heart, Shen's peacock parents consulted the soothsayer, who predicted that if Shen continued to pursue this dark track moving forward, he would be stopped by a warrior of black and white. In essence, a panda would stand between Shen and everything he was seeking. Learning of this prophecy and internalizing his desire to take so much more than the Gongmen city throne, Shen set out with a pack of wolf soldiers to wipe out the nearby and prominent panda village in hopes of ensuring that he would never be able to be stopped. Shen desperately attempted to change his fate, but of course, as Master Ugwe had once explained, that was impossible. And personally, I love this connection to the philosophy of the original Kung Fu Panda. One often meets his destiny on the road he takes to avoid it. The parallels between Shifu attempting to continue to restrain Tai Lung and Shen attempting to alter his fate and not be stopped by Po are amazing to be able to witness. Shen and his warriors burned down the village and slaughtered the pandas who lived there. Families were destroyed, children's lives were taken, and it seemed like pandas were erased from the world even though some did survive. A child originally named Lotus had his father and mother protect him, while that panda's father fought off the wolves and was able to retreat to a hidden panda village in the mountains, his mother hid him in a radish crate that would later be sent to the Valley of Peace. Unknown to Shen, that panda would be the one who had been foretold to bring his undoing. Feeling satisfied though with his efforts, Shen returned to the Gongmen City Palace only to find his parents in horror of the atrocities that he had committed. While Shen felt pride in his accomplishments, his family could see through what he had done. Shen had transformed himself into a genocidal, blinded murderer, but 
but even still his parents' disapproval damaged him to the core. But while Shen was only attempting to bolster his legacy, he was really only tarnishing his life forever. In response to Shen's deeds, his parents banished him from his home and he was left feeling unloved, unappreciated, and despised. My parents hated me. They wronged me. And I will make it right. From that day on, Shen was really unable to take responsibility for his mistakes. He had little empathy for his parents and what they had to go through because of his actions, and instead only continued to move forward with his own devastation in his heart. This inevitably resulted in his parents dying of broken hearts themselves. They loved you. They loved you so much that having to send you away killed them. It was becoming clear to the world that Shen's white color, which often is meant to symbolize purity in Western culture, was truly taking on the symbolism within the Chinese culture. His white color symbolizes death. That symbolism paired with his name translating in English to divinity, deity, spirit, god, or deep thought revealed that he was a person who had come to believe that he was above the consequences of the world after he caused the destruction of so many lives. But his mistakes would only continue. After swearing he would return to Gongmen City and bring everyone within China to bow at his feet, Shen led his followers to the mountainsides where he constructed a massive factory. There, he built metal weapons from the resources of nearby villages that were capable of utilizing the destructive powers of fireworks. In Shen's mind, he held on to the belief that enough of these weapons would allow him to make China his. What I find particularly fascinating about Shen is how he seems so tormented and fixated on the past to inform his next steps. He just seems like he can't separate himself from the person his parents saw him to be and the glory that he wanted for himself as a young peacock. When I watch Shen, I just can't seem to pull myself away from watching him because it seems like there's just so much pain and madness behind every action. We can tell he's so intelligent, but he doesn't have any wisdom, so he's just kind of this misdirected warrior who's unwilling to change. I think Shen really rises to be one of my favorite villains in the Kung Fu Panda saga because of all of these complexities within him and his focus on changing the future without realizing the only way he can do that is by altering himself in the moment. He's unwilling to break away from the tracks that he set out for himself. The dead exist in the past, and I must attend to the future. And he's also so captivating because his role in Poe's life is so prominent. Shen and Poe's destinies are deeply intertwined since Shen tore Poe's family apart. And it wouldn't be until Shen returned to Gongmen City after 30 years of preparation that these two enemies would be drawn to face one another again. Shen's a fascinating character by himself, but he becomes even more intriguing because of how he has shaped Poe in the past and is able to continue to teach Poe how to move past his own tragedies. When Shen arrived at his ancestral home, he marched to meet the Kung Fu Council who existed as stewards of Gongmen City. Behind Lord Shen was his army and a single weapon from the massive arsenal he had constructed. After clashing with thundering rhino, storming ox, and croc, using his swiftness, agility, blades, metal augmentations, and swordsmanship to his advantage, he is eventually able to overwhelm them by using his own weapon. With the death of Master Rhino, Lord Shen claimed Gongmen City for himself, but regardless of his accomplishment, the soothsayer was able to see that his destiny had not changed, which of course infuriates the peacock. That's impossible. And you know it. Soon after this vision, Shen learns that one of the pandas who had escaped his massacre was returning to the city to face him. And while he continued to deny that this could mean that his undoing was still imminent, he also decided to stay on course to unleash his weapons across China, hoping that following his path would be the key to his victory. Shen hoped to prove the soothsayer wrong, so when Po and the Furious Five arrived in the city, he made sure they were hunted down and brought to him. Seeing the goofy, confident, and relaxed Po, Shen continued to deny his destiny, believing he would easily be able to destroy the threat to his empire, but of course, he was completely underestimating the might of the Dragon Warrior and the Furious Five. He had no clue what was going to happen when the noodle-loving bear was fighting him and would call out skadoosh. That's always the moment in Kung Fu Panda when everything gets real. Other movies have their taglines, but Kung Fu Panda's is skadoosh. It is the line. 
But of course, before Skadoosh is ever called out, and after Shen learned that Poe was unaware of his involvement in the Panda's family's destruction, he fled to command his men to take down his parents' palace. Everything that his family had cherished was being demolished by Shen's misplaced commitment to becoming the ruler of China. Especially once Poe began to escape his trap, Shen seemed to become obsessed with the death of the panda who was foretold to stop his reign. Lord Shen wanted the Year of the Peacock to begin, but he couldn't see that his scrambling to further his past horrors was going to lead to his undoing. With the panda still alive in Gongwen City, Shen decided to move forward with his plot by preparing his ships, weapons, and wolves to be ready to set out to seize the villages of the world. You just destroyed your ancestral home, Shen. A trivial sacrifice, when all of China is my reward. The soothsayer, now seeing Shen's destructive capability, pled for Shen to stop his mad ambitions, knowing that he'd never be satisfied by the path he continued to go down. But he just can't pull himself away. Watching this emotionally drained villain attempt to destroy everyone around him is so tragic, regardless of how much we all disagree with his actions. His pain, heartbreak, and longing for meaning in his life is felt with every action. Instead of being a villain who loves being evil, it seems like Shen is just trying to fully leverage his position as the monster that he allowed himself to become. Shen desires power, control, and a legacy for himself, but he also seems to hate himself as he does it. Happiness must be taken, and I will take mine. As Shen's army prepared his ships, Po came to confront him again, pleading for him to reveal his role in what happened to his parents as they battled. The answers were not revealed though, as this encounter inevitably led to Shen using one of the weapons on the Dragon Warrior, providing Shen the opportunity to imprison the Furious Five and sail his ships. Lord Shen hoped that the death of Kung Fu was imminent. China would know to bow before me. Of course, though, with the Dragon Warrior surviving the attack on his life, Po frees the Five, and with the help of Master Shifu, Ox, and Croc, they battle through the Wolf Army and are able to block Shen's fleet from advancing to the harbor. Well, that works until Shen callously takes out the Alpha in the Wolf Pack to allow his weapon to break through the barricade and anyone who stood in his way. Amongst the destruction in the harbor, though, Po does not submit to Shen, instead rising to face the Lord. Unknown to Shen, the Dragon Warrior had achieved achieved inner peace, meaning when the weapons sent their explosives his way, Poe was able to deflect the blast, eventually leading to Poe redirecting the weapons blast back at Shen, resulting in his ships being destroyed and leaving Shen with nothing. Here we see Shen at one of his weakest and most honest places throughout Kung Fu Panda 2, with an understanding that there is no longer a chance on that day that he would be able to rise above China, he desperately attempts to understand how the panda could have continued to fight when Shen had ruined the life he was born into. But even after Po says his piece and attempts to tell him that he chooses who he wants to be every day, Shen won't listen. Instead, Shen continues to keep fighting, scrambling to kill the panda who had undone the destiny he wished for himself. But as he uses his rage, fury, and anger, he doesn't realize that he was cutting the few cords that were keeping the ship together. This resulted in the cannon of his ship to fall on top of him and cause a massive explosion that took his life. To his last breath, Shen hoped to break away from the opinions of his parents and establish a legacy for himself. But at the same time though, we saw Lord Shen be unwilling to break away from his madness as he blindly followed his pride, arrogance, and mistakes until that path led to his downfall. Tai Lung and Shen were both consumed by their obsessions with fate, and General Kai walked a similar path. He was the brother of Ugwe, who succumbed to his darkest desires and became a monster. You see, 500 years before the Dragon Warrior rose to become a master of Kung Fu, Kai was given control over a great army, but he wasn't alone. Kai fought alongside Ugwe, his brother-in-arms and his closest friend, and together, the duo marched across China and established themselves across the world as formidable warriors and thoughtful leaders. Kai especially stood out amongst the two of them, as he became known at that time in history as the supreme warlord of all China. But inevitably, every name Kai was 
given would eventually be forgotten. You see, after Kai and Ugwe's army was ambushed, Ugwe became mortally injured, leading Kai to carry his friend for days high into the mountains looking for help until they discovered a secret village of pandas. In that ancient place of healing, the pandas healed Ugwe using the power of chi, and once he was healed, both Kai and Ugwe were taught how to use this spiritual energy. But while Ugwe focused on unlocking how to give chi, Kai became obsessed with taking the power for himself, leading to his eyes glowing green, which symbolizes his blinding desire for more. Instead of striving to find balance, Kai fell to his dark tendencies as he became singularly focused on the selfish and destructive path he was going down. Now, why Chi corrupted Kai is never truly explained, but to me, I think it makes sense that he would rise to become the Jade Slayer, the Master of Pain, and the Maker of Widows because of his experiences seeing Ugwe almost die. He was a young bull when he became a hero of China, but no matter the accolades or the victories he had, nonetheless, he was unable to protect his brother from every threat. Seeing Uwe almost die meant that Kai finally knew that he wasn't all powerful, and I think that scared him. While Uwe wanted to ensure that he could heal the world, I think Kai decided that he never wanted anyone he loved to suffer or die from any enemy that opposed him. So he decided to take the chi of others to protect his family. But when Uwe saw that Kai was stealing chi for himself, he couldn't allow that to continue, and what followed was a battle that shook the earth which ended in Kai being banished to the spirit realm. The very person Kai was willing to do anything to protect was the very person who took his life away, leaving him full of loneliness and rage. I loved him like a brother, and he betrayed me. At that point, Kai took on the titles of the Jade Slayer, the Collector, and in China he was known as Tian Sha, meaning ferocious spirit from heaven. Now that Ugwe had cut ties with his friend, I think it was here that Kai's transition from war hero to unhinged spirit warrior became solidified because he had no more connections to his humanity. He was on his own and no longer could exist as a mortal being, which led him to take action for hundreds of years in hopes of undoing Ugwe's acts against him. In hopes of taking vengeance upon Ugwe, Kai forged two jade blades on chains, scoured the spirit realm for kung fu masters he could confront, and stole the chi from each and every warrior who existed in the world. But who were all the masters who fell to Kai? Under Kai's control, there were legendary warriors like the Master Badger Twins, who were remembered for their willingness to protect the innocent from the strong, and became famous in the kung fu world for their double gong technique, which was a move that had them crashing down and striking enemies together. There was also Master Porcupine, who protected China with his bow of justice and used his own quills as arrows. The Masters of China were a pretty diverse bunch, to say the least, and they all had their own very cool weapons and powers. Other Masters within the Spirit Realm, whose chi was stolen during Kai's imprisonment, included the likes of Gorilla, Boar, Crab, Elephant, Frog, Hippo, Komodo, and Goat. There were so many animals pushing forward the realm of Kung Fu that were eventually abused by Kai. Their very souls were being manipulated. You see, Chinese jade is traditionally tied with heavenly properties and indestructibility, which resulted in jade being associated with the soul and immortality. So what Kai was doing to those he took chi from was literally stealing their essence and their soul to empower himself. The stronger the person, the stronger the chi, which meant throughout those long years, Kai sought out the most formidable warriors who had already transitioned into the next life. And I think this is a fascinating concept. Not only could he use the jade zombies, otherwise known as zombies for Poe, as puppeteered soldiers who marched across the land, but he was also strengthened as a warrior by their connection to him. Jade zombies? Yeah. Zombies! Jade! Over the years, there was clearly a growing influence within the Jade Palace around the remembrance of these past masters. The Valley of Peace seemed to be celebrating Ugwe and his students who had traveled to the spirit realm, and those warriors were the same ones who were being used as slaves for Kai. Many of these masters were highly venerated by their pupils and students who lived after them and were even memorialized in the Jade Palace's master garden, including one master who had recently fallen. 
Thundering Rhino, the former leader of the Kung Fu Council in Gongmen City, who was said to at one point be unstoppable until he was killed by Lord Shen, faced a similar fate to these long deceased masters after entering the spirit realm. In addition to masters who were faithful to the teachings of Wu Wei, even Tai Long was also forced to serve Kai. After Po used the Wuxi finger hold on Tai Long, the son of Shifu who once believed himself to be the dragon warrior, he also confronted Kai and was taken down. And studying the chains that were bound to Kai, we can see that the snow leopard appears along them, showing us that Tai Long had his chi stolen. While Tai Long was one of the most feared warriors that had ever come out of the Jade Palace, so of course Kai would target the young warrior when he arrived in the spirit realm, he was also not invincible. I'm sure at that point in Kai and Tai Long's life, Tai Long didn't stand a chance. Still though, I think it would have been an awesome spirit realm battle. Tai Long was a highly skilled individual with great strength, determination, and ferocity. I mean, the occasionally cynical, serious, and hardened Master Shifu even believed Tai Long to be the dragon warrior himself. So my guess is that his chi was something Kai would have craved. I would love to see this fight in animation. I understand that it really wouldn't have propelled the plot forward in Kung Fu Panda 3, but that would have made one amazing bonus feature short because Kai and Tai Lung were two formidable warriors that nearly brought the Valley of Peace to destruction. At that point though, Kai had already spent hundreds of years collecting the chi of masters across time, so it's likely that there was very little Tai Lung could have done to take down the warlord of China. I mean, through all of Kai's preparations across centuries, not even Master Ugwe was able to stop him. Nothing could have kept Kai from taking Ugwe's chi that day. The reason he's doing everything is because he feels like Ugwe hurt him. And that's where I think it was the most interesting thing about diving into his character was trying to get into those layers of why did he feel like Ugwe was betraying him? While Ugwe did joke around with his former friend, nonetheless, he was in pain seeing how far he had fallen. When will you realize the more you take, the less you have? Ugwe could see that he would eventually crumble from his pursuit of power and the vanity that had replaced his good nature by the warrior he had chosen before he had passed on to the spirit. Realm. Once Kai was in possession of Ugwe's chi, he hung him close to his heart, swore to stop the warrior who was sent on a path to defeat him, and then used all of the power he had acquired to return to the mortal world. As soon as he arrived in China, the reality that he had been erased from history became clear to him, while Ugwe's role in the world had become solidified in everyone's minds. That's why, once his jade zombies, or jombies as Paul calls them, are sent out into the world to find Ugwe's pupils, Kai becomes focused on tearing apart his former friend's legacy. He swore to destroy everything he had created. Now, the reason I think Kai wanted to dethrone Ugwe as a legendary warrior comes from his own pain, arrogance, and jealousy. Kai believed his actions to acquire power were meant to be used for good, but because Ugwe disagreed, all of his heroic actions were ripped out of history. I will not let you destroy Ugwe's memory. Why not? He destroyed mine. That also feels incredibly unfair to him because he's convinced himself he's infinitely more powerful than Ugwe ever was because he is able to use the chi of many masters. But even with those good intentions and his strength, the villagers across China nonetheless adore the memories of his brother in arms who he felt betrayed him to try to make amends for this erasure since he feels that if he would have been able to live out his life 500 years ago that he would be the warrior that the world remembers members, I think Kai foolishly believes that he can use his current power to undo Ugwe's impact in the world. Kai is blinded to the fact that Ugwe is powerful because of his impact into the people that he interacted with, and that's the same reason that Po is able to defeat him. And that's something that he just isn't able to fully internalize into himself of why he can't actually destroy Ugwe's legacy. I don't think titles or praise were the reason Kai went down the path of acquiring power, but I think his frustration with his enemy being remembered as a hero mixed with the vain belief that he could shape the universe with the spiritual energy he he possessed led him to desire to be seen again as the supreme warlord of all China. There will be no one left who will even remember your name. Eyes 
Now, while I acknowledge Kai needed to be stopped once he returned to the mortal world, I feel really conflicted about Kai's origins and about the role Uwe played in creating this villain. To me, it seems like Kai did everything for Uwe, but no action he took was ever the correct one, which led to him and his tail being hidden from the world by his friend. It seems like during the mortal life of Kai, he was making mistakes like Poe's fathers and was only met with violence and banishment. Sometimes we do the wrong things for the right reasons. But do you think Uguay handled Kai as best as he could? Or do you think he only helped push the spirit warrior into the monster he became? Regardless of Kai's creation though, when Kai returned, he began traveling across China in hopes of facing every living master. This brought him into contact with the likes of Master Lizard, Eagle, and Storming Ox. The latter being another member of Gongmen City's Kung Fu Council, who we had seen fight alongside Po and the Furious Five to free that city from Shen and his wolf army. Ox was highly adept at pinpointing an enemy's weakness, but when he came against Kai, I'm sure there was no way to achieve victory since Kai literally had the might of numerous masters throughout time. <laughs> Even Master Bear with his brute strength and high aggression was taken down along with the fearless Master Chicken and the impenetrable Croc. To be honest, I wasn't too surprised about Master Chicken getting taken down, but seeing Croc fall was kind of heartbreaking knowing that his friends had also been enslaved before him. Master Croc was the only member of the Kung Fu Council who we actually got to see searching for Kai, but his experience, toughness, and bravery resulted in him falling like the other masters from Gongmen City. So even though Lord Shen was never pursued by Kai, the true Kung Fu masters from Shen's home were taken as servants for the spirit warrior. And inevitably, Kai confronted the students who were closest to his former friend. Approaching the temple his brother had constructed, Kai mocked Uguay and the warriors who praised him. Look at you pathetic fools, groveling at the feet of Ugwe the Magnificent. Showing that his respect for his friend and the mortals of this world had completely vanished. Quickly, Kai and his zombies took down Shifu and the remaining members of the Furious Five, only falling for a moment when Tigris used an enhanced chi kick. After that moment, he used the full extent of his power to take down the masters, allowing him to use his chains and blades to throw Ugwe's statue into the Jade Palace, destroying much of the knowledge the Kung Fu master left his students to protect. But once the Jade Palace had fallen, the only remaining objective Kai had left for himself was to defeat the warrior who had been chosen by Ugwe to defeat him. Tracking Po to the hidden panda village in the mountains, he goes after the dragon warrior with an army of zombies, but is shocked to find they are being fought off by a panda army, which completely disorients him until he's forced to focus on an attack by Po. While the dragon warrior tried to wooshy finger hold Kai into the spirit realm, he isn't affected by the technique as a spirit warrior, giving him an opportunity to recall the chi of the masters and beat down Po. Towering over Po, at first he believes he has won, but Po is able to realize that he can drag them both to the spirit realm by Wuxi finger holding himself. Enraged that he was in the spirit realm again, Kai furiously attacks Po and begins to take his chi for himself until the dragon warrior resists his attack. Embedded with the chi of his students, Po unleashes the full power he now possesses resulting in the destruction of Kai's weapons, a horrible beatdown against Kai, and a declaration by Kai stating that he will hunt Poe's chi for another 500 years if he has to. Kai spent the majority of his existence craving power, attempting to vanquish his enemies and obsessing over his revenge against his closest friend, and he was willing to commit the rest of his existence to defeat the warrior Ugwe had sent his way, but he would not be given that time. Knowing Kai desired his chi, Po gives him the power that he had sought after, but instead of becoming omnipotent, Kai is overwhelmed by the energy that coursed through him leading to his spirit being erased in explosion of light. Kung Fu Panda is near and dear to my heart and I can't wait to meet the foes that Poe will face in the future. Maybe we'll even get to see him confront old enemies again like Tai Lung. To see what I believe has been going on with Tai Lung in the spirit realm after Kai's defeat, definitely consider checking out my video on whether or not he challenged and fought Ugwe in the spirit realm, which is linked down below. Thank you so much for watching, consider subscribing, and of course, have a magical day.